Hi, this is Dr. Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. In this video C of the connective tissues, our second to last video, but rather lengthy video, I begin to introduce you to the different kinds of connective tissues. So let's get started. Remember that all connective tissues arise from the mesoderm layer in the embryo. Some of those mesodermal cells can further differentiate to form mesenchyme tissue. And all of us still have mesenchyme cells that function as stem cells for connective tissues in our body. This mesenchyme tissue, which is quite abundant in the embryo, can give or will give rise to all four of the connective tissue groups, or I call them classes here. Our first class is the biggest. It's called the connective tissue proper with six different connective tissues in it. The second group we call the cartilages, and we see three types of cartilages. Notice there's no D in cartilage when you spell it. The bone tissues as well, and there are two bone tissues, and finally also the blood. Now in this video, I'm going to focus on all of the six tissues that form the connective tissue proper. I will briefly discuss the blood, not a whole lot, because you'll study it much more in AMP2. When it comes to the bone tissues for now, just be aware of the fact that our bone tissues are made up of compact bone tissue and spongy bone tissue. Those are our two bone tissue types with the cells found in the bone tissues as osteoblasts that can further differentiate into osteocytes. And you even learned a third cell type already called the osteoclasts. For now, that's good enough. When we get to the skeletal system, we will learn about the compact bone tissue and the spongy bone tissue in great detail. But let's um, talk a little bit more about the blood. So we already discussed that all of the formed elements um, arise from that hematopoietic stem cell, or called the hemocytoblast sometimes, by means of the process hematopoiesis, and all of that occurs in the red bone marrow, right? We've done that already, so I'm going to set that aside. But we do need to first, or we do need to address the question, why, why is blood considered a connective tissue? Well, blood is actually made up of, or let's put it this way, blood actually does follow the two criteria of connective tissue. And that is, remember, it must have extracellular material called the matrix. And it must have cells. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's start with the second criterion here, because even though they're not all true cells, we do have our formed elements, right? We have our white blood cells, our red blood cells, and our platelets, and those are our formed elements. That's the proper name of referring to them. If you uh, can't follow this, then please look at the last part of the previous video to better understand this. So we can put a check mark for cells. What about extracellular material? Well, definitely in the sense that the plasma is the ground substance. So the ground substance in the blood is the plasma. But does blood have fibers? Well, not when the blood is flowing, but when it clots, during the process of clotting, it does form fibers. As a matter of fact, these little fibers are formed during the process of clotting, and then all the formed elements get stuck in there, forming your blood clot. So because of that, because of the ability to make fibers at some point in time, we put a check mark next to um, our ground substance as well as fibers that make up the matrix of the blood and that therefore explains why we can refer to blood as a connective tissue.
this is all I need for you to know about the blood. Uh, so this slide plus what we discussed on the previous video. In the future in AMP2 you will study the blood in much greater detail. So let's now move on with the tissues that belong to the connective tissue proper group and there are six of them so we have a lot of work to do still. The connective tissue proper can be divided up into two subclasses. Oops, I meant to write connective tissue proper here. And one is called the loose connective tissues. And we see that areolar connective tissue is one of those loose connective tissues, and there are two more. In addition, we also see that within the connective tissue there are the dense connective tissues. So we have the loose connective tissues and the dense connective tissues. And within the dense connective tissues, we also have three kinds. So let's first focus on the loose connective tissues. And particularly the first one, areolar. This is that connective tissue that you always find right by the epithelial tissue. So this is what nourishes the, the epithelial tissues, maybe we should just add that here and takes care of the epithelial tissues. It's the most widespread. You find it all throughout the body and it can also serve as a, a packing material around many other tissues. Not only that, because it's very airy, that's kind of how I always think of it so that I remember the term areolar. Um, it can hold on to quite a bit of water and electrolytes. Sometimes that creates issues. If there is too much water leaking out of the capillaries, for instance, uh, which happens in, which will happen in many of your patients because of uh, various diseases that they might suffer from, or after a lengthy surgery, if all of that water begins to collect in the areolar connective tissues, then the patient will begin to swell up. And of course, we call that edema or becoming edemic. If we look at the mucous membranes, let's say we looked at the, um, the lining of the trachea, which has pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue, it'll always sit on, on top of areolar connective tissue. And there we refer to that areolar connective tissue as the lamina propria, like the proper layer. We also have mucous membranes, remember, in your stomach as well as in your intestines. You've learned about the epithelial membrane. So the lamina propria is often a name used to refer to the areolar connective tissue layer in the mucous membranes. This tissue is rich in fibers and it has um, all the different fibers. There's plenty of space for vascularization, so I'm going to add that. It is very vascularized. And because there are tons of fibers, we see that the fibroblast cells are the most common. So let's take a look at a slide. This is a very high magnification of areolar connective tissue, so high that it's not even seeing or showing any blood vessels. But bear in mind that there are plenty of blood vessels. I put plus BVs so that you don't forget that this is very vascularized. The labels CF and EF point to the collagen fibers, which are those big, thick, thick pink ribbons crisscrossing through the slide. And then the the thin black lines are representing elastic fibers, but you can assume that uh, reticular fibers are present also. Okay, lots of matrix, meaning lots of ground substance and lots of fibers. The fibroblasts are the most common cell type because after all we have so many fibers. So this letter N is pointing or is the label for pointing towards the 
nuclei of fibroblasts. And often the fibroblasts are kind of, have kind of flattened nuclei. Here we see some more. Here's another one. If we continue our discussion of the connective tissue proper classes, remember you have two. You have the loose connective tissues and the dense connective tissues. Within the loose connective tissues, we studied the areolar connective tissue already. And now we're going to take a look at the adipose connective tissue. And then there will be a third one coming up. So adipose tissue is really fat. And it has various functions, as you know. It's, it's, we store fat, which is a way to store energy. Um, but it's, our fat tissue can also provide us with um, protection from um, um, heart falls, for instance. So it cushions us. And it also provides some insulation. It can also hold organs in place, like you'll see a lot of fat around your eyeballs, around your kidneys. As a matter of fact, you know, you've all, we've all seen, unfortunately, images of starving people in various parts of the world. You might have seen concentration camp pictures, and people's eyes are very sunk in. Um, cancer patients, unfortunately, near the end of their lives often have that look, too, with their eyes really sunk in. And that has to do with the fact that a lot of that adipose, that fat tissue around the eyeballs, has lost. We have a lot of fat tissue deep to our skin. We call that subcutaneous fat. And um, <clears throat> the cells in our adipose tissue, um, in us adults, are referred to as adipocytes. And they are amitotic, meaning they do not divide anymore. They're mature cells. So... When we look at the slide here, you can barely see the cell membranes um, of the cells. And notice that they're pretty big cells because they're filled with fat. And here and there, you might notice that we see a darker spot. Those are the nuclei, the poor nuclei and organelles that are squished to the edge of the cell membrane um, due to the presence of all that fat inside of our uh, fat cells. Again, what is not showing on this slide is blood vessels. Fatty tissue, adipose tissue is very vascularized, which is why we often get subcutaneous injections. Subcutaneous injections. Injecting into the adipose tissue underneath the skin is very effective because of how vascularized fat tissue is. Whatever we're injecting enters into the bloodstream rather fast. The other thing that this picture, this slide, doesn't illustrate very well is the fact that fibers are actually present. So you need to kind of use your imagination and we might be able to actually point here, maybe in this area, there are actually fibers present. This is a pretty low magnification, um, <clears throat> but please assume that. What else? So um, we see good vascularization and we do see the presence of fibers. This is a tissue that is kind of different from many of the connective tissues in that it is actually quite cellular, right? Something it shares with the epithelial tissues. I'd like to come back to the fact that the adipocytes are amitotic. In other words, fat cells in us adults do not easily divide, if at all. So you might wonder, how is it then that we can get fat? How do we get obese? Um, well, there's, there's a lot of studying being done, as you know. There's a lot of research being done on how we can control our weights better. But when we put on weight, we typically just shove more fat into these cells. There is some research suggesting that if fat cells reach a certain size, they might be triggered to divide. I don't recall that being shown in humans. I believe that's been shown in rodents. Um, 
we do still have adipoblasts as we're growing, as when, when we're growing children. So that's the time to really watch our diets when we still have those dividing adipoblasts. Once we're adults, we pretty much have a set number, more or less, of adipocytes. Here you see a slightly higher magnification. You see how big the cells are. You see how the nuclei are kind of pushed to the edges of the cells. And then here, this is probably a little blood vessel here, not sure, but that's approximately where they would be. They would be squeezed in between the cells. So this brings us to our last loose connective tissue in the connective tissue proper group. So quick recap. So the connective tissue proper class, I guess I called it a class, um, is made up of the loose connective tissues and the dense connective tissues, which we haven't started yet. And within the loose connective tissues, we first studied the areolar connective tissue, the fat tissue, better called the adipose tissue, and then the finally the reticular tissue. In a sense, you've already learned about this tissue when I introduced you to the reticular fibers. Clearly, a tissue is called reticular tissue because it has lots of reticular fibers. So this is the kind of tissue that you find especially in um, organs that are part of your red bone marrow. And these are three really good exam examples for you to memorize the lymph nodes, the spleen, and the red bone marrow. Remember those reticular fibers form a stroma that your formed elements, your red blood cells, white blood cells in particular, can hang out in. Let's take a look at a picture. Here we see that same picture that I showed you before when I was introducing you to the reticular fibers, <coughs> which are all the little black lines. And so this represents the spleen. Okay then, so we're done studying the first group of our connective tissue proper, our first class, which was your loose connective tissues. Do you remember what the three tissues were that we studied? Areolar, adipose, and reticular, right? So now we're starting the second subgroup of the connective tissue proper. We call them the dense connective tissue. And you're quickly going to see why. It's because they're very densely populated with fibers. So many fibers that you can hardly see anything else. <clears throat> and so this is our first dense connective tissue. Um, there are going to be two more. So the first dense connective tissue is called dense regular connective tissue. And the reason why it gets that name is because the fibers, and these are almost all collagen fibers, are organized in a very parallel manner. And I'll show you that on the slide here in just a moment. There are so many of these parallel arranged fibers that the poor fibroblasts are just squished in between to where we just barely see their flattened nuclei. Because this tissue is so packed with fibers, it's hard for blood vessels to make their way in there. So it's poorly vascularized. Um, you, you might have experienced the, the fact that this is poorly vascularized because this is the tissue that you find especially in the ligaments and the tendons. And if you've ever injured a tendon or you've ever injured a ligament, you know how long it took for it to heal. And that has to do with the fact that there is not a very good blood supply to these organs in the body. Now, because this is made up primarily of collagen fibers, clearly it's going to be um, resistant to pulling. I explained to you that collagen fibers can stretch a teeny bit, but then they lock up. They provide tensile strength. And the tension is going to only be dealt with in one direction because all these fibers, these collagen fibers, they run very, very parallel to one another. <clears throat> 
with the poor nuclei of the fibroblast squished in between. You'll see this on the next picture. Aponeuroses, by the way, are just flat tendons. And when you look at some pictures, for instance, of the muscles in the skull, you might see, or even in the abdominal area, you'll come across some of those really flat sheet-like tendons. We call them ap aponeuroses. So in our second group of our second class of connective tissue proper, that is the dense connective tissues, we just finished discussing the dense regular connective tissues. So of course, that must mean there is a dense irregular connective tissue, which is the one we're about to study. And then there will be a third one. Let's just go right to the picture to make more sense of what this slide says. So this slide shows both dense regular and dense irregular connective tissue. Can you see the big difference? In dense regular connective tissue, notice that all the fibers run very parallel to one another with the poor nuclei of the fibroblast squished in between all of these many, many parallel collagen fibers. That's not the case in our dense irregular connective tissue. Notice what kind of a mess it is here, implying that our fibers run in multiple directions. And we don't just have collagen fibers, we also have other fibers, particularly if we were to look at the dense irregular connective tissue in the dermis. And we find this dense irregular connective tissue around some organs as well. Uh, and you'll pick up on that as time goes by, which organs will have that. When we get to the cartilages, we'll bring it up um, as well. <clears throat> now, if we focus on the dermis, which is that deeper layer of the skin where we begin to see blood vessels, then um, it makes sense that it's important for that layer of our skin to have some flexibility. It can be pulled and yanked on without it getting damaged all too much. So the tension can come from many directions for the dense irregular connective tissue, which I describe or list in the previous slide. Dense regular connective tissue can only withstand tension in one direction. After all, all of these fibers run parallel to one another. Remember, dense regular connective tissue you find especially in tendons and ligaments. So here we're taking a look at a picture of the skin. Of course, we're going to study the skin in the integumentary system. E is pointing to our stratified squamous epithelial tissue, which collectively, including all of these dead squamous cells, um, collectively all of that we refer to as the epidermis from there to term E, right? There's no vascularity in there. And then we see all of this connective tissue here. Most of that, especially where everything looks so messy here, is that dense irregular connective tissue. The D stands for the dermis. Um, there is, uh, of course, again, going to be some areolar connective tissue just right next door to our epithelial tissue. But most of this here is dense, irregular connective tissue in the dermis. Okay then, I think we're beginning to see the end. So remember, within the connective tissue proper, that is one of the four groups of connective tissues. There we've learned about the three loose connective tissues, areolar, adipose, and reticular. And we're here finishing up the dense connective tissues. And so far we've looked at dense regular connective tissue, dense irregular connective tissue, and now we're looking at three, I should remember these, the third one called elastic connective, connective tissue. And in a sense, again, you have studied this tissue when I introduced you to the elastic fibers. So the slide 
that's coming up is a slide you've seen before. So once again here we're looking at that artery full of elastic fibers in its wall and remember elasticity always refers to stretching and what else? Recoiling, don't forget that, right? Okay, so we find this tissue which is rich in elastic fibers, much richer in elastic fibers than any other fibers, probably no collagen fibers whatsoever, in areas that need to be able to stretch and recoil. Lungs are another really good example. Now, a little warning, be careful. We're going to learn about the cartilages in the next, in the next video, and there is a so-called elastic cartilage. Keep in mind, that the cartilages belong to a totally different class of connective tissue. So I'm going to write here that elastic connective tissue is not the same thing as elastic cartilage connective tissue, right? So especially if you are in lab where you have to identify microscope slides, if you put as your answer elastic connective tissue thinking that that's good enough to tell your instructor it's elastic cartilage that's just not going to fly. The cartilages are completely in their own group. Keep that in mind. So that will the cartilages we'll discuss in our very last video on the connective tissues then.